Our scripture reading this morning is from the book of Revelation, chapter 21, verses 1 through 5. Let us hear the word of God. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the former heaven and the former earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, made ready as a bride beautifully dressed for her husband. I heard a loud voice from the throne say, look, God's dwelling is here with humankind. He will dwell with them and they will be his peoples. God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Death will be no more. There will be no mourning, crying, or pain anymore, for the former things have passed away. Then the one seated on the throne said, look, I'm making all things new. He also said, write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Thanks be to God indeed. So you may be familiar with the story of the preacher who stood in the pulpit one Sunday and looked out among the congregation that was gathered and invited folks to raise their hand if they were ready to go to heaven, all right? Anybody ready? Anybody ready? It's not just a fictitious story, all right? Actually, it is a fixed, fictitious story. And the truth is, is that when the pastor uh, did this, uh, everybody in the congregation raised their hand except for one lowly guy who was sitting in the fourth row. He didn't raise his hand, and that caused the, the preacher to, to have some concern. And so he looked at the gentleman and he said, don't you want to go to heaven? And the guy looked back and said to the preacher, I do, I do want to go to heaven, but it sounds like you're trying to get a, a busload to go today, and I'm not ready to go today. <laughs> the truth is we all, deep down inside, long for heaven, right? I mean, we've been, we've been singing this morning about the saints. How many of you, uh, for, for how many of you was the, the hymn that we opened with this morning a new one? One that you hadn't sung before, several folks, right? It's not one that we typically sing because we typically sing... Uh, a couple of different ones on All Saints Sunday, and that's the day that we, we often focus on, eternal life, on that, that part of our journey of faith that exists beyond what we can see, what we've already seen, and what we already have experienced. We've been on this journey for the past several weeks as we've been examining the heart of a Methodist the unique and distinct elements of, uh, of the faith that we have as United Methodists. We've talked about a variety of things. We, we began with that idea of our longing for holiness, right? As a deer pants for streams of water, so our souls long for living water, for, for God. There's a deep longing within us. St. Augustine once wrote that our hearts are restless until we find our rest in Thee, O God. Right? That there is a, a, an unsettledness in our lives until we find our relationship with God. It's as though there's a heart-shaped hole in our lives until God comes and fills it. So we long for holiness. We also talked uh, about 
a heartwarming experience of God's grace. We looked at, at John Wesley, the, the founder of the Methodist movement, his experience of gr God's grace, even in the midst of his failures, even in the midst of all of his faults, the Holy Spirit spoke to him and, and caused a stirring deep within that he referred to as a heartwarming experience whereby he was assured of God's love, assured of Christ's forgiveness, and assured that Christ was alive in him and at work in him. We continued last week by, by talking about how uh, we engage in this relationship of pursuing grace, that God's grace pursues us first, but that we respond by pursuing that grace in response, right? As, as, as a way of living it out. We talked about three different kinds of grace. That prevenient grace, that grace that goes before us, that surrounds us as, as water surrounds a fish. Sometimes we aren't even aware that we live in a sea of grace. But it's not enough to simply live in a sea of grace. We must be brought to a point of, of transformation. We must receive Christ. And this is the work of justification. It is the point whereby we recognize through the power of the Spirit that our lives have gone off track and that the only way that our relationship with God can be restored is in a relationship with Jesus whose sacrifice on the cross has reconciled us, redeemed us, and made us one again with Christ. In faith, we believe in Christ. And in faith, we are made to be, as those who had not sinned before, justification, making us just as though we had never sinned, right? But then it's not enough just to be reconciled. We have to figure out how to live in re relationship anew. And this is the ongoing work of the third kind of grace, which is sanctifying grace. This is the grace that, that comes with justifying grace, almost as a, a partner in order to, to continue the work in our lives and in our hearts. This is the kind of grace that causes us to, to pursue the kind of relationship that matures us and grows us, that challenges us and seeks to make us whole, that we continue in this relationship of growing and learning throughout our lives. What an amazing gift we have been given in the form of sanctifying grace. It is this sanctifying grace that leads, that is the, the bridge toward what I would call the fourth movement of grace. And it is this fourth movement of grace that is the hope of we who call ourselves Methodists. This is perfecting grace. This is the kind of grace that leads us to the very point of perfecting our ability to love God and to love our neighbor. It is the power of God at work that will allow us to fulfill God's greatest command, that we should love God with all of our heart, mind, soul, and strength, and that we would love our neighbor as we ourselves have been loved. This work of, of perfection in a world that strives for the perfect complexion and the, the perfect figure and the perfect house and the perfect children, 
Well, let me tell you, it's not about any of that. <laughs> you see, God's perfection is the kind of perfection that is not able to be seen with the eye. It is only a able to be experienced within the soul. It is the full transformation of one's heart. John Wesley would have called it entire sanctification. When the work of God's making us holy is complete and full in our lives, and we as Methodists live in that hope each day. Now, most of us don't achieve it each day, but we live in the hope and we trust in the power that makes it possible. And that's what I want us to talk about this morning. I want us to talk about perfecting love. I want us to talk about entire sanctification now, I'm not going to ask you if you want to go to heaven, because I'm going to assume that you do. But I am going to ask you, are you pursuing it? Are you pursuing the goal of heaven with all that you are and with all that you have? Are you living in, in such a way that you are indeed not just desiring, but moving closer ever more each day toward living in the full light of God's love. You see, that's what this is about. It, it, it's about what happens on this side, but it's also what continues to happen beyond. It, it's not about whether or not we attain it, we can't in and of our own power, right? It is the very work of God within us. It's the power of the Holy Spirit continually cleansing our hearts and, and setting us on a right path that will lead us to the very gates of heaven. I, I know that this can seem like pretty heady stuff, but I think it's pretty practical as well. At least that's how John Wesley saw it. He talked about a practical divinity. That is, a divine God dwelling within ordinary people as we walk together in the strength of the Spirit, living out our everyday lives as a reflection of the goal as a reflection of the aim. And that's why I ask, are you pursuing it? Are you striving after it? Do you want it as a matter of conscience? And, and do you act upon that desire in your everyday living? Are you seeking to look more and more like Jesus each day? You see, John Wesley would have said that that's how we're supposed to live, each and every one of us. In fact, for him, it was such an important part of his understanding of what it meant to be a Christian living in the world that those who sought to preach, those who sought to be leaders, those who sought to, to take a role of leadership within the Methodist movement, were asked a series of questions by John Wesley. Those who are ordained in the United Methodist Church are, are asked a series of questions that are referred to as Wesley's historic questions. There's 19 of them. But among those 19, there are three that pertain to what we're talking about today. John Wesley would have asked, are you going on to perfection? Are you headed in that direction, right? The next question was, do you expect to be made perfect in love 
in this life. You see, it's not just a goal that exists on the other side of the gates of eternity. It's a goal that exists here and now. And as United Methodists, we hold out the hope that it is possible and that we will strive for it and toward it with all of our lives. Which leads to the third question. Are you striving after it? Are you chasing after it? Do you want it more than anything else? Do you want to love like Jesus? Do you want to look like Jesus? Do you want to live like Jesus in the world? Because that's what it's ultimately about. That's what Christian perfection is all about. It's about less of us in us and more of Jesus in us and through us in our daily lives. It's about being able to, to surrender ourselves each morning and say out loud, not my will, but thy will be done. And then doing all that we can to make sure that it happens. This is what perfection looks like. This is what Jesus has given us a glimpse of. It's a relationship with God that is whole and holy, intimate and pure. It's the kind of relationship in which Jesus walked with the Father, one with each other, and we are called to do the same. This passage of scripture uh, from the book of Revelation is, is the vision of John of Patmos. He, he's describing what he is seeing in, his, in a time of, of deep and abiding prayer. He talks about seeing an old thing that has passed away and a new thing that has come. He talks about this space in which there will no longer be a sea of sin and shame to separate us from God. You see, that's what the waters represent. And as we pass through the waters, as those who, who did at the Exodus, we find ourselves on the shores. Shall we gather at the river? Right? That's what it's about. Shall we gather there? And shall we cross over Jordan together in order that we might experience this unique and dynamic relationship with God that exists not only here, but also in eternity. This is the desire. And what remains in the end is only love. A love that perfectly unites us with God and with one another. That's perfection, isn't it? Us and God, a restoration of Eden, if you will. Like two people standing at an altar looking into each other's eyes. They see only love, only love, and only a desire for more of it. Like a couple about to be married, we too shall find ourselves each standing before God as a bride, beautifully adorned, clothed in the righteousness of Christ. God will see us with eyes of love, and we shall behold the one from whom love has flowed and filled our hearts. It will be heavenly. <laughs> I don't know about you, but I'm feeling a little bit more ready than I was when we started this morning. Maybe not ready to go today, but still, 
I'm feeling like I want to go. I want to be a part of it. The Apostle Paul, in a letter to, to the church at Colossae, also encouraged people using this image of being beautifully clothed, beautifully adorned. He, 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 said, he encouraged them to look to that day, to look to Christ and to, to set their sights on the realities of heaven, to think about the things of heaven so that the fullness of our lives here might be informed and shaped by our understanding of there. Paul says that we ought to clothe ourselves with tender-hearted mercy, with kindness and humility, with gentleness, patience, forgiveness, and love. My question is, are those things a part of our everyday attire? In our conversations with one another, in our interactions, wherever we are, do we find ourselves showing forth these attributes? Are we consciously putting on these kinds of things each and every day? Friends, when I think about the goal of my life, uh, when I think about the life that I live in Christ, when I think about the promise of heaven and spending eternity with God, I find myself wondering. Sometimes I look in the mirror and I, I realize that I am an awful lot more like the guy who struggled to raise his hand. Not because I don't want to go. I do want to go to heaven. I do want to spend eternity with God. But I know that there's still so much work to be done. I'm not yet complete. I'm not yet perfect as God wants me to be perfect. I, like you perhaps, still struggle to love myself as God loves me. And I struggle to, to love others the way that God loves me. We all find ourselves at times struggling. It's not that we don't want to spend eternity with God. It's just that we each, if we're honest with ourselves, we recognize that we've not yet experienced perfection on this side. So perfection on the other side feels so unattainable. It ought to humble us. It ought to cause us to pause. It ought to cause us to strive all the more. John Wesley thought it was important that we think about our life, to think about our life here and now, and how we will live it in response to God's grace. But he also wanted us to consider our death. Yes, I know that's a hard topic. Most of us want to avoid death at any cost. But the truth is, is that it's part of our life especially when we understand that our life is eternal. Because we must pass through death here. We must walk through the valley of the shadow of death. But remember, friends, it's only a shadow. And the shadow is created because of the bright light of Christ's redeeming love. When we pass through, we will find that indeed death has lost its sting. That death, according to John on Patmos, is no more. Indeed, there is an end to crying and to mourning and to pain because God is making all things new. Praise be to God. Amen. This morning, I want to invite you
to consider the realities of life eternal with God. And I want us to to ask ourselves some questions about how we honor God in this life and how we will honor God not only in our daily living, but also in our dying. I've thought about it a little bit. And I want to live a life of love. I want to live a life wherein I swim in a sea of grace where I am enveloped by it and surrounded by it and and experience it so fully that it's hard to even fathom. I want to be filled with a power, a power that comes from God, the very power of the Holy Spirit, so that I and we together might honor God not only in our living each day, in our serving Him and one another each day, but also in our dying. Because when I think about the way that I sense God calling me to live, it's also the way that God is calling me to die. In faith, to myself, in faith, in Christ, in the strength and power that He alone can give. So friends, let's pursue entire sanctification. I I know most of us are likely to miss the mark. We're likely to fall short. But let's hold it out as a goal not only for ourselves, but for one another. Let's encourage one another to live our fullest lives in the direction of heaven, in the direction of eternity, so that when the moment comes and life here is over, we can believe and live in the fullness of life that never ends in the closer presence of God, and in the sea of love that endures forever. I want to live that kind of life. Anybody else want to go with me? Let's pray. Lord God, we thank you and bless you for these holy moments in which you reveal yourself to us. Help us each and all together to live holy lives, pursuing and aiming to love you and one another with a perfect love. Help us to live as those who are prepared to die. Help us to trust that in life, in death, in life beyond death, you are with us and that nothing in life or in death will be able to separate us from your great love in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen.